has seen the involvement of new policy actors. And I'm thinking here of edgy businesses, I'm thinking here of philanthropies, I'm thinking of individual uh, entrepreneurs, um, and so on, and an enhanced role of international players beyond the nation. So that, that, that's my topic. This is an Australian cartoon, um, and the question at the bottom of it is, was, what is globalisation? And the cartoon says that's when a woman in New York, a man in Hobart, a child in Oslo, a canary in Milan, an old lady in Peru, a dolphin off the coast of Madagascar, all share the same anxiety, the same despair, for the same reason at the same time. Now, I think that's picking up on a converging construction of globalisation, as if we're all experiencing the same things and we're responding in education in similar ways. Now, I think that's true, perhaps, at the level of discourses, but never as true in, in terms of what actually gets enacted through policy within nations. Because each nation has its history, its culture, its politics, there's a path dependency, and the global pressures beyond the nation meet the national and are played out in diverging uh, hybrid ways. But there are uh, convergences in the discourses. And this is what I'm uh, going to uh, speak about, say something about education policy, globalization and new spatialities, and the new actors come in because of new modes of governance. And I'll do, if I get a chance, two cases. Now, my cases aren't from the Gulf. Um, one is US and Australia, and the other is sort of US and global. But I want you to try to take the cases and see how the argument I'm trying to sustain might apply um, in this particular context. So what is uh, policy, and how is globalization affected? In a book I did with my colleague Basil Risby, we took this old definition from the US, policy is the authoritative allocation of values. And we argued that globalization had affected each element of that definition. So authority, uh, the legitimate right to exercise power, used to be in terms of policy within the nation, but there's now authority from regional, cooperative councils, there's authority from international organizations. Allocation, the state's been restructured from classical bureaucracy through new public management and to network modes of governance. So there are new relationships and policy works in different ways. And the values uh, embedded in policy now, the discourses, the ideologies are not only from within the nation, but there's global discourses, um, knowledge economy, human capital, world-class universities, um, and so on. And so the bottom quote I've taken from one of Stephen Ball's recent books, education policy analysis can no longer sensibly be limited to within the nation state. Policy analysis must also extend its purview beyond the state and the role of multinational agencies and NGOs, World Bank, UNESCO, to include transnational business uh, practices, edgy businesses, ed tech industries, but I've added in there and also philanthropies, and often there's a, an interesting mix. If you take the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, philanthropy, but still linked to particular uh, business interests. Here I'm just making the point that policy is discourse, policy is text, and policy is an act. Uh, and we need to think about what we're talking about. And what I tried to say at the outset was that the convergence is really at the discursive level, not so much at the text level within nations um, and the enactment of that policy uh, within nations. But in terms of the discourse, we do have this global language of education, global education policy discourses, policy scapes that flow across nations. Uh, global education policy, so that we do have some sort of uh, flow of ideas around, around the globe. And we made a distinction in our book between the space of global education policy discourses, the sort of abstract notion, and the place where the policy is enacted. Now I think in terms of the new spatialities, we tended to think of the global as out there, 
affecting the national and affecting the local. But I think we've got to make more complex the way we think about that. Because the national is central to the global, as is the local. The relationships go backwards and forwards. They're not simply top down. We might see globalization as the context of context, but we need to move beyond a binary place, space, local, global, national, international. And we must understand that schooling systems, higher ed systems, schools are now located in multiple geographies and relations, locally, regionally, globally, um, and the globals played out nationally. Um, and so on. So the nation state is still important, but it works in different ways, given um, these multiple geographies of power um, and policy. So if we come to the new uh, spatialities of globalization, and what I want to do here is get a bit more theoretical, but I'm talking about the empirical changes to spatial relations on the globe, which have, have been part of the sort of globalization we've seen uh, for the last 30 years or so. I'm going to look at that, but I'm going to look at the way different theorists have tried to understand uh, what is going on with these new spatialities. And I'll look at these approaches, the common world culture or neo-institutionalism or global policy argument, a globalized localisms, localized globalism's argument, a rescaling argument, a topological argument, and an argument about an emergent global education policy field. And I'll say something about each um, briefly. If we take the first, the common world education culture, or neo-institutionalism, or global polity, this is an argument that the development of national systems of schooling has had more to do with universal models of education of the state, of society, rather than national factors. It's a sort of global spread of modernity. And the nation state has seemed to be embedded within a global society. So we have an institutional isomorphism. So schools um, in the UAE look like schools in Kuwait, schools in Australia, schools in China, um, there's, there's a world model, so to, so to speak, linked to a notion of modernity. Now, I would argue that, that, that there's been a change, and there's a sort of hyper-rationality with well, the metrics we have, the rankings of universities, uh, the work of IEA, um, OECD, Tim's, Perlis, Pisa, um, and so on. And I think we have multiple modernities rather than just one model. And I, I could critique this model, but it is one quite powerful way that's been used within comparative uh, education uh, to understand globalization and what's happening in schooling uh, systems. Roger Dale has juxtaposed that model and been very critical of it because there doesn't seem to be a politics, how do the global model get distributed and so on. Um, and he's argued for a globally structured agenda, a sort of political economy approach. But that's one argument about um, a, a, a universal model of what educational institutions are. Another is from the, uh, the Portuguese sociologist, um, de Souza Santos, who argues that globalization is globalization from somewhere. And he makes a distinction between what he calls globalized localisms and localized globalisms. And he puts power into the equation. So he says that the powerful nations on this globe, say the USA, things develop there as a local, but get distributed global and become a globalized localism, are taken up in other nations and become a localized globalism. Um, an interesting way to think about the way those global discourses um, work. So we, it's a globalization of a particular globalism. Globalization producing localization. And some of you may have read um, Salberg's book on what he called germ, 
global education reform movement, but it's an Anglo-American reform movement. And coming out of the UK, or England more, and coming out of North America, the USA. Uh, it, it, there's a local development, but it's sort of been globalized in many other nations, my own in Australia, who took up national testing uh, from what was happening in the US, a national curriculum, a bit like the Common Core State Standards in the, in, uh, the United States, and so on. So another way of looking at the new spatialities um, and the way these policy scapes flow um, across the globe. Rescaling is another way of looking at this. Neil Brenner, um, the British sociologist, political scientist, argues that the state has been rescaled so that um, the state has relationships, if you look to Europe, with the, so within one of the constituent members of the EU, with the EU, but it also has relationships with the OECD, it has, and, and so there's like this Russian Pushka doll, um, relations within relations, and the notion that the state um, has been rescaled. But <clears throat> there's still an assumption of a national, territorial, and geopolitical definition of space. The nation state still remains the unit of analysis. But the conception is the state that runs it and develops policy is rescaled into these regional and national uh, sets of relations. And I've got a quote at the bottom here um, from Susan Robertson and her colleagues applying that model um, in education. And it's interesting, if you look at the first sentence, it says the shift from national to post-national. Now, once the Berlin Wall fell, the Cold War ended. There was this view that maybe we were moving towards a post-national world. And this piece by Susan Robinson and the colleagues was written in that context. And I think we clearly aren't in a post-national world. Uh, the nation state remains important. And I think if we look at the big changes in the globe since um, the end of the Cold War, um, we see the nation state still remains important. But there are elements of this policy scapes, the post-national, that flow across the nation. So rescaling is another, um, another explanation of the way the new spatialities of globalization work through in and through educational governance. Now, Roger Dale, in a really much quoted paper, and many of us have been waiting for him to write a subsequent version, which never seems to appear, but he, he wrote about the sort of rescaling and so on, and how the global and some of these discursive convergences occurred. And he argued there were these sets of things, imposition. So World Bank lends money to a nation, and the quid pro quo is they have to put these policies in place or harmonization. So there might be something about quality standards in higher ed across the Gulf Cooperation Council nations, or the European education space. Dissemination, the flows of this supposed best practice ideas. I always think there's no such thing as best practice. Whatever we do, we can always make it better. But um, the notion that ideas can be taken from there and located into there, or some time ago, Martin Lorne and I wrote about when we looked at what was happening in Portugal in respect of OECD, um, we found that Portugal was realigning a lot of their statistical collections to align with the OECD categories. And when we interviewed policy people there, they talked about this magistrature of influence uh, which impacted what they were doing. Standardization is really important here. But if you think of the impact of international large-scale assessments, PISA, TINGS, PEARLS, you think of the impact of the university ranking, Shanghai, Jiang Tao, the metric, and what's valued and what isn't, um, that's a factor in that rescaling. And the fact that many issues we face, climate change, can't be confronted by individual nations alone. It has to be a global policy, but the Paris Agreement or if we look at the Sustainable Development Goals, or if we look at educational hubs, say in Dubai, twinning arrangements across universities, and so on. 
Now, this is a more complex way um, of thinking about the new spatialities of uh, globalization, associated with globalization. The topological sees the significance now as relations. So say a school within a nation doing IB, it's connected to other IB um, schools around the globe and the IB community. But it has relation from a very local to a set of, of global. Um, that, that, and, and what is significant here is relation, not location, so much. But the reconfiguration of the spatiality of social relations is a central aspect of contemporary globalization. It's the point I was trying to make at the outset about school systems being located in multiple um, geographies. And there's a quote I have from Asha Lin um, at the top here about the topological. Now, I hope this might explain it better. This is a map of the London underground, the tube. And it's a <coughs> topological map. What matters in this are the relations between stations. This isn't, like, if you look at this, this is topographical. This is the actual relations between the stations. But the map that represented, and I think it's the same with the metro in Dubai, um, is topological. What matters are the relationships, not the geography or the topography. And there's a whole set of relations now in education uh, which are of that kind. And perhaps the best example, well, we're just trying to pick up on this, what the topological is. And, and it's a sort of post-Euclidean geometry as well, and it's location rather than relation. Power is exercised by reaching into the politics of regions and localities in an attempt to steer and constrain agendas, bridging the gap erected by physical barriers. So with power typologies, is not so much positioned in space or extended across it as composes the space of which they are a part. And all of these global metrics um, do this. In Australia, we have a national test. Schools are compared with 60 other like schools across Australia. I talk to principals. They don't know any of the other 59 schools. Their schools are in the middle of Brisbane. They're compared with schools in Darwin, in the middle of the Northern Territory. There's a topological relation. And the argument is that they're similar places, even though they aren't geographically, topographically um, connected uh, at all. And a good example is PISA-based tests for schools. And I'll say something about this a little later. You all know about Maine PISA, uh, which is the test of 15-year-olds in the three areas of literacy every three years from the OECD, which compares the performance of nations on schooling. What PISA-based tests for schools does is do a comparable test, but it can be taken by individual schools. Right? Individual schools whose performance is then compared with nation's performance. I'll say something about this a little later in terms of new actors, because PISA-based tests for schools has been totally funded by an American meta-philanthropic uh, group called Academic Achieves, and all of the big philan uh, philanthropists um, in the US have put money into that. All of the money in it has come from philanthropic sources. The OECD agreed to this, but there's new topological relations. So we've studied Fairfax County and the state of Virginia in the US, and all of the schools in that county do PISA-based tests for schools and compare their performance with that of Shanghai, Mexico, Finland, uh, and so on. Can you see the new sort of relation, the different relation? It's relation rather than location. And there's a whole lot of quite strange things about it, comparing your individual school with a national schooling system somewhere else, um, which is, which is um, interesting as well. And what we see with this is the OECD, which is an intergovernmental. 72 nations participated in 2015 PISA. But what this is, is the OECD, through the money from philanthropists, um, getting inside nations. And the schools that participate, in the US, pay 11,500 to participate in it. 
They can do it any time they want, not every three years like main pizza. And in the first instance, a private company, CT being McGraw Hill, it's now a not-for-profit, um, got the money to manage the test for the school and produce the reports for the school. So you can see new players as well as the new uh, relations here. This is just from one of the reports I took. You could look at your school compared with all the schools in the US, schools in Shanghai, schools in Mexico. Can you see this as a topological relationship? It's not, um, okay. Another way of thinking about this, which I've written a little bit about, is using Bourdieu's concept of fields. And to argue, if we go back and look at the history of national statistical systems, and there's some wonderful work on this, we see the way that the creation of the same measure of things across a landmass, a nation, was an important factor in creating the nation. Yeah? And I would argue similarly, homologously, that if we look at things like PISA, TIMS, PEARLS, university metrics, that they do the same. They help constitute a global field. And we all get pulled into that, um, to that global field. Um, and remember, Bourdieu says field is a structured social space, not geographical. There was some work that I did in interviewing all the senior people at the OECD and policy makers in the UK, US, um, Canada, and Australia, and Japan around PISA. What started to strike me was when I interviewed the policy people at the OECD and in all of those nations, they fitted into the exact same epistemic world. But I, talking, interviewing the person in Canberra, I could have been interviewing the person in um, Tokyo or the person in Paris. And then when I talked to the technical people, who, the psychometricians and others who create the tests, when I talked to those people in Australia, those people in Japan, those people, they were also in the same um, epistemic community. And there was a way in which the habitus of those, the way the discourse is constituting uh, their being, the shared policy habitus, I think, helps construct this emergent global uh, policy field. Um, and, and that's the point that I just made. Um, and, and what we did, in some analysis we wrote of this, we've got international policy makers, national policy makers, international policy technicians and national policy technicians. And, uh, I, and I did these interviews with a young colleague. Um, and when we come out of the interviews and say, you know, we could be sitting in Canberra, Paris, Tokyo, Washington, that they were all speaking. Their, their dispositions. The difference between the policy people was that they were about the data's intersection with politics, whereas the technicians, saw themselves like us. You know, they used to say to us at the OECD, this is a non-academic university. Um, and the technicians there were the same as the technicians in the testing authorities in Tokyo and in Washington and in um, Australia. So that notion of the global policy field. Okay, new modes of governance. And, and I think this is reasonably straightforward. But I think certainly in particular nations of the global north, um, including mine, which is geographically located in the south, of course, that there's been a move from the sort of classical, Weberian, hierarchical, technically rational bureaucracy with hierarchy of rules, etc., through new public management, where that's been a bit pulled apart and the big strategic goals are set at the centre, and the relationship to those who enact it is often through key performance indicators, data, auditing, um, and the like. And, and numbers in that new mode have become very important. And then the argument is that we've moved on from that new public management, at least from the bureaucracies and the state structure of the nations of the global north, to network governments, where what you have is private sector players, edgy businesses, ed tech industries, the philanthropic, you know, public par private partnerships is one example, but have come inside the state and are involved in, in policy making inside the state. If we look at this more formally, 
the change in the form and modalities of the state. In the world of network governance, where I think we're at, but of course there's still the residues of the bureaucratic and the new public management. Government is understood to be located alongside business and civil society actors, and I would add in philanthropies, philanthropists, in a complex game of public policy formation, decision making and implementation. But the difference now is that that's stretched globally as well. Right? And when I go on to look at a case from the global education industry, we'll see that the OECD's position now is that um, those other new players, edgy businesses, ed tech industries, philanthropic groups, should be involved with the state and the production of policy. And that raises whole sets of questions, of course, about the usual arguments about the democratic and what sort of schooling you end up with and, um, and so on. I've got a quote here, the privatisation of the education policy community. Well, it's the partial privatisation, I think. Um, some have argued the authority of the state's diminished. I think it works in different ways rather than so much diminished. And I have, again, that quote I had from Stephen Ball at the outset about we can't now just consider policy within the nation. We can't consider it just within the state. We've got to look at edgy businesses. I also argue philanthropic groups. We need to look at that regionally. We need to look at that globally. And we need to think about those different spatial relations um, I was trying to outline before. And what's central here are numbers. Central to network governance, which is about comparison. It's governance through comparison, the move from government to governance. It's why these have become so important metrics, um, ranking universities globally. We know, if we go back historically, that statistics, the word, state numbers, and they've always been important to the construction of the nation state. But numbers, importantly, in this global age, as Ted Porter argues, are a technology of distance. And Peter is a technology of distance. Um, the same as the, the metrics for university uh, rankings and so on. And all the auditing, the evaluative state and so on. And all the mantra about evidence-based policy. I, I, I always argue strongly that you can only ever have evidence-informed policy because you've always got politics, not just evidence. And you've always got professional knowledges um, as well. In Australia, the politicians use evidence base um, when they've chosen some particular set of evidence to justify what they want to do, while trying to hide that it's much more a political decision than one based in evidence. Um, and of course, the enactment depends upon professional cultures um, and knowledge. Now this is when I want to come to my two cases, which are about the new actors in the context which I hope I've tried to quite quickly um, encapsulate. And we, we've always, or well, we've had in the post-war period, but even earlier through aid and so on, international organisations, I think they've become more influential in the current context. We've had the rise of regional organisations. So if you look at the Caribbean, there's CARICOM. Of course, we've got the EU, the Gulf Cooperation Council, in Asia, there's ASEAN. Um, and the new players are edgy businesses, in tech industries, and uh, entrepreneurs. An Australian colleague, John Hattie, at Melbourne University, anywhere I go in the world, there seems to be some seminars being run on visible learning, an individual who is um, a sort of entrepreneur of this whole uh, place of edgy businesses. And, and he has a company connected to it, and this visible learning for everything, early childhood, math, science, and so on coming out, and philanthropists. And there's a new philanthropy. You know, the old philanthropy um, simply gave money for things to happen. I think of the new philanthropy, it's more we give the money for you to do this. It's much more directed. Some talk about philanthro uh, capital in that context. So my first case, and I hope this isn't too obtuse, but it is, is looking at one element of, of what uh, Tony and his colleagues call the global education industry, and it's data infrastructures. And it's the development of something which Bill Gates and the Gates Foundation and Microsoft have been central in what's called systems interoperability framework. 
SIP. This is a standard so that all of your software, all of your data in systems, in nations, globally, can be made interoperable. And they've developed a standard for this. And in this case, what we see are the new policy actors, the energy businesses, edtech companies, philanthropists, and OECD is also involved. And there's new spatialities, new geographies, and it's an example of edtechs making policy um, with the state as an example of network governance. And I, I quote Tony and his colleagues' work here, where they define the global education industry the ways edgy businesses with full profit motives and new philanthropies heavily involved, are heavily involved in all aspects of education today from agenda setting through the provision of goods and services. The OECD now also formally talks about GEI. There's some astonishing figures there um, from Tony's book uh, about uh, in 2014, 4.3 trillion in value of the global education industry. Pearson, the biggest energy business globally, British, in their report said this would be the biggest growth industry of the 21st century. It's been enabled by some of that state restructuring and globalization, standardization, policy as numbers, and those things I talked about earlier. Tony Berger in his book argued these six reasons why the global education industry has emerged. And you can see them there. Uh, globalization of the economy, commodification of schooling, financialization of the ed sector, changes in governance. I've talked about emergence of an evidence base, or in my thinking, evidence-informed policy, and the whole technology thing, computers and classrooms, ed tech, and so on. But, um, and Tony's heard me say this before, I think they've underplayed the significance of data and data infrastructures and the interoperability um, issue. So data infrastructures, there's a lovely book um, which I've read so many times. Um, I don't like its theoretical frame, but it's empirical documentation of what she, Keller in, uh, Easterling, calls extra statecraft. She says today that private businesses are central to the creation of infrastructures that are central to the functioning of nation states and globally. Infrastructure underpins a lot of these global moves, new spatiality. And the commercial, the ed tech industries are involved with governments in this. And standardization is the language or currency of it. Uh, and there's some lovely pieces in that book where she talks about the ISO, the International Standards Organization. You know, it always amazed me. I was with my wife in um, Istanbul, and she put her credit card into the ATM and it said, Welcome, Ms. Lingard. And she thinks, well, Here I am. In and who knows, uh, you know, and that's the standards, they're all the same size, the whole, yeah. Um, and there's some of that going on um, in education. So what about SIF? It was a standard developed by Bill Gates, the Gates Foundation, and Microsoft. He launched it in a speech to the US School Administrators Conference in 1999. It was developed and led by Microsoft, but with support from other ed tech companies in the US. Um, and then in 2006, he, he made a speech in which he talked about the necessity for schooling systems to have a digital nervous system, which is interoperability for all data. Um, a SIF association was formed in the UK in 2006, 2009 in Australia. In the US, there's the launch of SIP in 1999. In 2003, the Federal Department of Education comes on board with Gates Foundation and Microsoft to develop this systems interoperability framework. In Australia, we've got a federal system, so schooling's controlled at the state level, um, but all the ministers meet, and they made the decision that Australia would adopt and develop the systems interoperability framework. There's now a national association, and it consists of USA, UK, and Australia, and I understand that the EU is looking at accepting um, SIF as well. And this international organisation, which really is the organisation of EdTech industries that want to create data and infrastructure for schooling systems to allow them, that they argue that it constitutes the most comprehensive data model mature infrastructure interoperability framework in use globally uh, in education.
Now, I'll try to do this Australian case quite quickly. And my point is, basically, Australia's taken that SIF, has now got a program called the National Schools Interoperability Program. And all the schooling systems in Australia, independent, Catholic, <coughs> government, at all the state and territory levels, have agreed that all the data about kids should be able to flow across the nation between systems, and, and that's why we need a particular version of SIF. And we have developed um, in Australia a national schools uh, interoperability uh, program. And standardization is central to it. But we see network governance because it's been developed by representatives of all the schooling systems. But central players have been the ed tech industry. But it's policy determined by them together. Network governance, not government determining policy. The framework on the website, if you want to look at it, the Systems inter Interoperability Framework, widely known as SIP, is an international specification for the exchange of school data. The SIP Association is made up of education providers, software vendors, who have a common interest in having software applications interact and share data. Globally, um, there are that many. And you can see that the market gets bigger and bigger um, for ed tech industries if there's this total interoperability between all the data sets um, everywhere. And, and, and not differences uh, between. And this slide is simply about this point. The OECD could see what was going on here. They've adopted the concept of the global education industry, and to date they've held two global summits on the global education industry, where edgy businesses and representatives of government, ministers, policy makers have met. The first um, was in Helsinki in 2015, 2016, one um, in Jerusalem. And so what you had was government and the ed techs together. And the summit discussion topic I've got there, in the fourth point down, schools need a physical and digital infrastructure through which improved teaching and learning products can be delivered. Now, they're talking about schools here. Um, and there is a consensus. I've, I've read several times Andreas Schleicher, head of education of the OECD, his after dinner speech. He basically says governments have to work with the ed tech industries to develop data interoperability. Um, exactly what's happening in the Australian case. And can you see here the new actors? You've got um, the ed techs with government um, formulating policy. An idea that this data can flow across nations because of potential interoperability. I've done a case study of um, 11 states in the US, also funded by the Gates Foundation, who are going to have and have tried to achieve the interoperability of all data about all young people across those 11 states. The parents in those states were up in arms because of the potential to sell to third parties, and they defeated that despite 120 million of um, Gates Foundation money going um, to back it. But can you see, see my argument about the global, new spatialities, new modes of governance, new actors? Okay. Um, Easterling, in her book, says, contemporary infrastructure space is the secret weapon of the most powerful people in the world, precisely because it orchestrates activities that can remain unstated, but are nevertheless consequential. I mean, she says, with all this going on, we know, uh, I've spoken to large teacher conferences in Australia, not one of them knows anything about the National Schools Interoperability Framework. It's as if, you know, I think about the Facebook stuff recently, and what this, I mean, I think there's some interesting um, things here. My second case, and I'm mindful of time, and I've said something about this to date, so I'll be reasonably quick, but it's PISA for schools. Initially, it was called PISA-based tests for schools. But what we see with it are new policy actors, philanthropies, edgy businesses, not-for-profits, OECD, individual schools, and local school systems. And the new spatial relationships are here, and network governance at play. So it's a US philanthropic foundation um, which pushed for PISA for schools, American achievements. In the US, it's a federal structure, but they just get the data for the nation. So they can't pair, compare state performance, as we can in Australia, as you can in Canada, as you can in Germany, 
Um, and some schools thought, oh, they did much better than the US, and they wanted to, to, to show this. And it's interesting, the schools that participate in this in the US are high-performing schools. You know, and um, my young colleagues interviewed some of the school principals who'd say things to him, my school's better than Finland, or my school's better than Shanghai. Now, I mean, how you compare up school with an entire schooling system um, is, is, is an interesting question there. I said something about this before, but what it allows is school-to-school -school comparison within a nation, outside a nation, school-to-nation system, and uh, Academic Achieves has got a goal of having 100 schools globally which are in a global network, and they'll compare and do PD um, and so on around their PISA for schools results. Now the interesting thing is that it, the results are comparable. All of the psychometric work's been done so that the school performance can be compared with national um, performances. So it enables school to school, national, international comparisons possible, um, school to school comparisons as well. That's how one of the reports looks. I showed this before, schools in the UK, schools in Mexico, and you can see over to the left, your school, and then comparing. Can you see this is topological as well? It's relation, not location. Topology, not topography. Um, here's an example of maths, and then your school's maths performance against Shanghai, China, Singapore, Korea, Finland, can you, um, you know, and some of this is going on in the north of Spain, in some schools in parts of Europe, and some independent schools in the UK. The nation has to approve um, schools doing this, and that has been approved in those parts of the globe. There's no schools at this point in Australia um, doing uh, piece of based tests for schools. Now, in terms of my argument, and I'm coming right to a close now, in terms of piece of the schools, actors and networks. So the oversight is still the OECD and the PISA governing board. And the PISA governing board has on it all the uh, nations who participate in PISA. Uh, it, it was uh, chaired by Lorna Bertrand from England. It's now chaired by an Australian who's head of the Federal Department of Education. I know that there was real concern for the PISA governing board about whether this was an acceptable thing to do, these are for schools. Uh, but remember, there's no public money, it's all private, philanthropic money. Uh, it's schools and the local wanting it. The actual test was created by the Australian Council for Educational Research, not for profit um, group, who did have the contract until 2015. Uh, they had developed all the PISA tests to that point. Administration, promotion, and, and recruitment. Um, these philanthropic groups down the bottom, the, they're the groups that put money into America Achieves to get um, PISA-based tests for schools going. And the test proficient and data analysis is done um, for PISA for schools uh, by other types, private edgy businesses um, and uh, some other not-for-profit. But can you see how this is a whole new ball game, really? Um, in terms of the spatial, the global, the actors involved, um, and so on. So, look, in conclusion, <clears throat> I hope I've, I've shown that how we define and think about policy, whether it's the discourse or enactment, has implications for what, how we see what's going on. So, policies, discourses, texts, processes, enactment. And I think the convergence is at the level of the discourse globally. But there's always, because of the path-dependent specificities of nation, vernacularization of policy and policy practices. I hope I've shown that there are real and new spatialities associated with globalization, and network governance and new policy actors, the edgy businesses, um, strength and roles of OECD, UNESCO, significance of data and data application. And I hope I've shown that school, school systems today are situated locally, nationally, and globally, situated in multiple spaces of power and policy, with the seeming overcoming of the ontological distinction between place and space. That is, the new technologies um, allow that. And my question that I'll end with and put to you is, what are the implications of this?
for how we think about school and how within nations we can provide the best quality schooling, but not just that, the best quality schooling for everybody so that it functions in a socially just, inclusive way. And what are the implications for the involvement of these new policy actors on a global scale in relation to how that plays out within a nation and that, that set of questions. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. You might